In my last chapter review, I talked about the possibility of a betrayal between Orochi and Kaido, and uh, it happened this chapter. Orochi got his head lopped off by Kaido. Now, once again, it is One Piece, so it is a question of is he really dead because we just saw Pound come back alive and Oda's known to be pretty soft with death. But this time around, it's a little different because there's some actual logical ways that Orochi can still be alive. And we'll get into all that, but in this chapter review, we start at the top, starting with the color spread. No cover story this time around. Instead, we get this double page color spread of Law, Kid, and Luffy uh, colored, eating some food on top of parrots. Always cool to see just like a colored spread done by Oda himself. Could be a little bit of foreshadowing what's to come for these three having a big spotlight in one. But either way, I'm just happy we don't have to see the Pound cover story. And yes, that's what I'm calling it now because Pound defined that cover story with him coming back alive. And it was a very boring cover story. But what's not boring is the chapter. One Piece chapter 985, the new Onigashima project. And for those of you who tuned into my live reaction or have watched it, I was excited just reading that title. Finally, we're getting to figure out exactly what this plan is, why Big Mom and Kaido decided to team up and what their motivations is. And we do get a little bit of information on that, but the first thing we see is actually Kondro versus the Scabbards. Now, at first when I saw this, I was a little confused because I did not expect Kondro to show up that fast again. So pretty much, Kondro showed up in Onigashima, beat a bunch of beast pirates up, dropped off Momonosuke, and then hauled ass to the back to confront the scabbers. This man has been proven to be very competent so far as a villain. Now, it looks like he shows up with some headliners, and I say headliners for multiple reasons. One, Kondro is a smart dude. He knows how strong the scabbards are. I don't think he would just show up with some gifters. And also, one of the headliners there mentioned that he saw the scabbards at the execution 20 years ago. So these are some seasoned veterans of the Beast Pirates. But besides that, he's also drawn himself some headless horsemen that also depict the scabbards, so kind of like showing how evil he is. Now, I'm wondering really how strong these people are because, you know, we saw like the painted Kondro, how he was easily cut down by uh, Kinemon, so we don't know if these horsemen are actually there to like provide him strength. I could see it going either way, one, to just add more strength to Kondro as a villain, and also to add to the sinister side of him as a villain, where these guys can't even really fight, but he's just sh drawing them for show. Speaking of Kondro as a villain, if you thought he was redeemable at all, in this chapter, he uh, lowers that a little bit, because it turns out Momonosuke, first of all, a little bit of props to Momonosuke, because he got, grabbed the knife, cut his ropes open, and also poked a little hole in Kondro's palm there. I don't know why Kondro had a band-aid with him. Maybe he drew that as well. That would be a cool way to explain it. But yeah, Momonosuke did a little bit of damage, but then Kondro returned it by like a hundred times. He knocked him and beat him up until he was unconscious. And now I kind of feel bad for laughing at Momonosuke for being beat up. And uh, yeah, he almost died. Kondro even said himself he was surprised that uh, Momonosuke was still alive after all that. But Momonosuke will get his shine. Eventually, Zunisha could come. Momonosuke gotta show off that dragon form as well. I'm sure Momo will get his shining moment, just not now. Also in this scene, before we get to the whole Kiku and Kondro confrontation there, we see a lot of scabbard interaction, which is great to see. First of all, just seeing Izo alone is good to see. I really like his design. It's just good to see Izo again. Also, Nekamamushi and Inurashi showing off their own things. First of all, Nekamamushi doesn't really explain his gun arm and how he got it, but Inurashi does say, hey, that's nice. And then Inurashi shows off his own sword leg, which is such a dope idea and design. I don't know how I didn't come up with that. And also in the official translation, I'm noticing those two being a little nicer to each other. Nekamamushi also complimented Inurashi's little upgrade, so it's kind of showing those two are really becoming back to, like, friends again. And then one final thing to note about this scene is, where is Law? Because we saw Law right there with them last chapter. Now, right now, they are in that upper entrance at the top, so Law, along with his crew, who are, like, also nowhere to be seen, they could have gone down to the other path to explore what that is, and the scabbers just went up to go and attack Kaido. So there's a lot of possibilities of what Law could find down there, like he could run into a Toby Robo or something, but I did think about this, because Momonosuke, not looking good right now, Kaido's right there, we'll talk a little bit more about it later, but uh, I think the first big thing is gonna still be saving Momonosuke, and a lot of people have talked about Law as the best candidate to do that with his whole room ability, but what if Momo is about to get killed, because Kaido could kill him in like a split second pretty much, and Law can't really think that fast to switch him with something else and he switches himself. A lot of people have been talking about Law potentially dying in this arc and that would be a pretty impactful thing. Like we're going to say Momo and like people are starting to fight. All of a sudden Kaido just decides to end it 
tries to kill Momonosuke, Law switches himself with Momo, and Momo is safe, but Law now is dead. And then like maybe Act 3 ends or something like that. That would be a pretty mad moment. And honestly, for those of you who watched my like Wano tragedy video of who could potentially die in the arc, I didn't see Law dying because like at this point, I feel like it's we know him for too long, but this chapter really escalated and took everything to a darker level. So like, I could see Law potentially dying that way and being the big tragedy that escalates this war to another level. But finally, let's talk about Kiku versus Kanjuro. Kiku puts on the helmet, decks herself out, is looking clean, and then she has this dope dialogue, which first she tells Kanjuro to shut his mouth, which is a dope moment from Kiku. Did not expect that. Official translation, big shout out to you. But then she talks about like her power, how her wounds like carry on into the afterlife. That's why she's called Kiku Nojo of the Lingering Snow. And that like, this type of information I'm dying to know more of, like the epithets of like the samurai and the scabbards, Foxfire Kinemon, he's able to light his sword on fire. What is the like the lingering snow kind of thing with Kiku is kind of getting explained here a little bit, but how does it actually work? And this is like what a lot of people wanted out of Wano, right? Samurai with special sword techniques and abilities like Kiku and Kinemon. These things have to be showcased and like we want to see Zoro like interact with swordsmen that could do different things with their sword. That's one of the elements of Wano I feel like has been missing and looks like we're starting to get into a glimpse of that as this war is starting to escalate. But yeah, Kiku straight up goes and attacks Kanjuro, who like doesn't care, says, come Kiku. And I was really curious how this battle would turn out because Kawamatsu, who didn't jump in the future and missed 20 years of training and everything, couldn't like beat up Kanjuro either. So Kiku, who like jumped into the future with everybody and like missed out on 20 years, I was really thinking she wouldn't be able to stack up against Kanjuro, but let's just jump into this right now and talk about it. At the end of the chapter, we see Kiku, blood on the sword and also crying through the mask. Now the first thing we think of when we see this is that Kiku like killed Kondro or hurt him some in some way and like she's crying because that was like a close friend. Like when Kinemon pretty much killed Kondro, Kiku was shown crying as well. So like if Kiku actually killed Kondro herself for real, I feel like she would definitely cry. I don't think it's that simple, right? Like Kondro being dead, not realistic to me. I think there's a lot more to his character that we have to know. It could be just very simple of like Kiku wounded Kondro and that battle was so intense that she started crying afterwards. Some people have mentioned she's potentially crying about Momo because Momonosuke is in a panel like directly next to hers but it's actually not like that. I think it's jumping scenes there because in the Kiku panel, you see there is still snow. So she's still outside and Momonosuke is inside in that central area. One curveball thing you could throw in there is like maybe something happened to Izo and like, you know, of course Kiku has like the blood from like maybe battling or something, but maybe something happened to Izo because I don't think Kondro would have lost that easily. I feel like he had something saved up in his sleeve because like him going up against all the scabbards, Power scaling wise, I don't do a lot of that, but he probably should have gotten body. Another idea I had is like with Kaido's announcement being broadcasted, the moment he kills Orochi, maybe that gets announced and broadcasted out, and then Kondro gets distracted for a second and Kiku cuts him. So maybe he suffers a wound and runs off or something like that, and then we see Kiku reacting all that. Kind of would even out the power scaling a little bit. Also wouldn't kill off Kondro right away because I think there's a lot more to his character that we have to see. But next we jump to Luffy and Yamato again in the action. And uh, let's just start here. Yamato for Nakama pretty much confirmed in this chapter. If you saw my live reaction, I was dumb hype when Yamato said, let me board your ship because you're Ace's little brother. What more do you want? She's asking to join the crew and board the ship. And at the end of this arc, she's definitely still going to want to do that. So like Yamato for Nakama has a lot of merit right now. And I've been on this ship since day one. Okay, I've been I made my Yamato for Straw Hat video so early that people are commenting on it. It's like, uh, you know she's a girl, right? No, duh. Obviously, I know now, but like she was a son back then wearing a mask. I had no idea then. But yeah, her asking to board the ship, like it's pretty much confirmed in my mind. Like even Carrot, somebody I think who has a lot of like qualities for a straw hat and like the foreshadowing 
is very much there. I feel like Yamato is one up now in likeliness because of that statement. At the end of the day, I want both of them, okay? Oda, you better give me both of them. I want Yamato and Carrot, but as far as you want to say one or the other, I think Yamato is more likely now. But getting back to the dialogue, the dialogue between Yamato and Luffy reveals a lot of information. One thing I did find weird though was Yamato mentions Ace last chapter at the end there, also mentions Ace in this chapter. Luffy doesn't have a reaction to it, like he's not not asking any questions like how do you know ace or anything like that which is a little weird to me maybe oda forgot but that's a pretty big thing to forget in the middle of a dialogue so that's a little weird to me but we do get some information on ace how like yamato wanted to travel out to sea with ace and his friends and also we found out last chapter and they fought so like the story of ace and wano is kind of really getting like developed a lot more here we're definitely gonna get a flashback here i don't i still don't like the idea of ace being like a beast pirate time temporarily joining kaido's crew i do think his time in wano was a lot more than we had initially expected of him just showing up and interacting with Tama and then leaving or something like that. Also, Luffy and Yamato's interactions here is like perfect for me. Like Yamato's expressions cha changing from like calm to like angry all of a sudden. And let me just address this thing real quick of her identifying of Kazuki Oda and why I refer to like her as she and everything. In this chapter, I feel like it reinforced the idea of like she's just trying to be Kazuki Oden. She's not really trying to become a man. I know other people refer to her as a son, but to me, it's just her trying to become another person. So she herself is still a female and like until something changes, that's what I'm gonna call it. But let's talk about the information we learn about Yamato. First, the handcuffs, right? So she's had those handcuffs on since she was eight. And this pretty much confirms my theory that she's 28 years old. So at eight years old, maybe she was at Odin's execution when like she saw Odin in this great like hour of legends and everything. And then she's like, okay, I wanna leave. Then Kyle's like, nope. Put on these cuffs. So if you want to tie that back to my Yamato and Nakama argument is that, you know, we get Jinbei, who is the most experienced person, Carrot, who will be the youngest person, and then Yamato, late 20s, we don't have anybody, like, right in the middle of that, like, group. Like, Robin and Frankie are within that age range, so, like, you're adding another person there. I think that would be a very good dynamic to add those three at the same time. Please, Oda. Please do it for me. But back to the handcuffs. The handcuffs she has is not just her like cosplaying Odin and like pretending to be him. But those handcuffs are the same exact ones Luffy had in Udon, but his were like on his neck. Yamato's would explode if she leaves Wano. Now she doesn't know if this is actually true. And I feel like this could set up a moment later on because Luffy, who has the ability to remove these cuffs, but he doesn't end up doing it yet because he gets distracted. Although thing to note there is he was very confident with it. So like him showing that confidence kind of proving his advanced armament is at a better level now. But him not removing those, I feel like could be saving up for a moment later on in the story. Maybe at the end of the arc, Kaido is defeated. Yamato still has the cuffs on and Luffy's like, oh, you're going out to ship with me. You're my new Nakama. Let me remove these cuffs for you. He removes it, grabs it, crushes it, throws it in the air, and it doesn't explode. That I feel like could be something Oda could do, but like at the same time, Kaido could just be a terrible father and like actually put explosives on his uh, daughter's cuffs. A lot of parallels here with Yamato and Sanji and the whole thing in like Whole Cake Island where Sanji had very similar cuffs as well. And I'm just very intrigued by the relationship between Yamato and Kaido and like what that is. And cause like right now, Kaido's kind of seen as like this deadbeat drunk stepdad, right? Like just drinks all the time. Yamato is talking about being abused as a child. And I don't want to take this lightly, but at the same time, it is like the the context of it, I need to know more because if you think about it, Garp did a similar thing with Luffy where he hit him in the head all the time with hockey, threw him in a jungle and all that type of stuff. It does seem like Yamato does want to see Kaido defeated as well, but like what would her reaction be if Kaido were to die? And Kaido, while obviously has chained up Yamato and all that, still calls her his son because of like her whole Kazuki Odin thing and also wants her to be the next ruler of Wano. That we'll get into a little bit later. But yeah, all the information we're getting here about Yamato makes me very excited excited for one Yamato for Straw Hat, two Aces flashbacks, and three Yamato and Kaido's like moments flashback and their history and their relationship in general. But next let's talk about the new Onigashima project which finally gets revealed now before we get into like the bulk of the project. Kaido foreshadows a lot of little things here. One he's talking about like the Marines powering up and like demolishing the Shichibukai system because they're confident in their new like force and development that's probably referring to Vegapunk and the SSG and he also foreshadows 
foreshadows this incoming final war, which is probably gonna be this last big war of like One Piece, right? If we're talking about Endgame, that's gonna be a mad, mad war. So if we're looking ahead to Wano, this could be like a little foreshadowing. Vegapunk SSG and all the things that are brewing in the background. The intermission between Act 3 and Act 4 is gonna be crazy. But the new Onigashima project, Kaido and Big Mom formally announced their alliance. Big Mom busts through with a bunch of homies. And she's looking terrified and thing to know here, she got Zeus back, okay? I was always on this ship for a minute, for a brief second. I did entertain the idea of Nami also getting Prometheus, but it's very obvious. It makes sense that Big Mom is able to get Zeus back because that's her own soul. And like Nami being able to keep Zeus will be number one, two OP. Number two will kind of downplay Big Mom's power a little bit. But yeah, Zeus gets body, gets taken back by Big Mom. And also Carrot and Nami got body by Big Mom too. So Sanji leaving to find prostitutes, that has an effect now. Like Nami got caught by Big Mom. So to me that like rubbed me the wrong way initially, but right now as we see the effect of him leaving, it just like makes it even worse because he abandoned a Nakama to a Yonko to protect and look for the prostitutes. And then one final thing about Big Mom's arrival is her and Jinbei are now in the same place. So we might see them like make eye contact, duke it out a little bit, maybe get some insight on what happened with like the Vin Smokes and the Sun Pirates and like did Jinbei really just get away and have a feast and like party with the Sun Pirates? So the big announcement here is Kaido and Big Mom are teaming up together to go after the One Piece? Like, I, I was kind of surprised by that. Like, weren't they doing that already? But I guess they were maybe just chilling and like doing their own thing and they really didn't go for it, go for it. But now it seems like they're teaming up and like really going for it together and becoming co-pirate captains, I guess. Now they also mention ancient weapons, which like nobody knows what or where they are besides like Robin. So like, I don't really know what they're talking about there, but Shout out to a person in my stream who mentioned this, I forgot their name. But they pointed out a very interesting theory is that Caribou and Fishman Island and Shirahoshi, that's getting tied back into this now possibly. Because remember Caribou, he knows that Shirahoshi is an ancient weapon and he got caught by Kaido and he doesn't seem like a person that would like be zipped up and like tight lipped, right? He would definitely reveal something of that information just to save his own life. And Big Mom, if she found out about this, she would definitely have reason to go after Fishman Island because Jean Bay betrayed them, the whole Tamate Bako incident as well, like destroying like Whole Cake Island. So they have a similar goal there. Both of them going to Fishman Island, wanting to attack that place and also getting an ancient weapon and then like declaring war on the entire world. And this is a very interesting way to do it as well because remember, Luffy declared Fishman Island as his territory. And now it's like a test, right? You declare that as your territory well now two yonko want to go and attack it are you able to protect it this is your first real test storytelling wise i think that makes a lot of sense so that could be the goal of big mom and kaido when they're talking about ancient weapons but besides the ancient weapons kaido's big plan is to turn wano into new york no not really but like kind of a foreign force coming in and then naming it a lazy name by just putting new in front of like your old place and then turning it into like a production factory essentially so like that's what kaido's plan is and i Obviously, Orochi doesn't like that very much, and then Kaido's response to that was just to decapitate the man. And uh, yeah, very shocking moment in general, and like, I didn't even notice King with the alley-oop. The perfect alley-oop to Kaido, that was smooth, and like, I was just so shocked by the moment, I didn't even notice that. Now, let's talk about the death of Orochi and if he's actually dead. Now, initially, in my live reaction, I said, I think Orochi's dead because, yo, he just got decapitated by perhaps the strongest pirate in the world. But now I've had some time to think about it, and there are logical ways that he could still be alive. One of them is that he was actually a Kondro painting, and now the way that it was depicted of Orochi's decapitation, the panels are kind of similar to when Kinemon decapitated Kondro as well where you see the head get split off one half of it fall off but at the same time there is a little more blood and then Kondro's body also dissipates within like five seconds now we do cut away from Orochi so we don't really see what happens to his body so it's very possible like next chapter we find out the body is gone and he's still alive I actually like the idea of his zone fruit being his lifesaver a little more now Orochi's zone is the Yamata no Orochi a mythical zone type now as far as I know no, yeah, it doesn't have the ability to like regenerate a head, but it does have eight heads that you have to cut off to kill. Now, I like this a lot because one, it like 
gives us a little more information on zones. Are you able to also use his abilities in human form? I know Marco might have been able to like take some damage as well in human form. I feel like he was in like hybrid form most of the time. So like Orochi, was he in human form? I feel like we need some more information on that. But Orochi being alive because of his devil fruit power will also boost like zones a little bit. Like hockey can't defeat everything. Even somebody like Orochi can tank a hit essentially from Kaido if he had the right devil fruit. I like that power balance element. Now the counter to this is like Orochi and Kaido have been allies for like 20 plus years. Would Kaido really not know Orochi had this power? And honestly, I feel like Orochi is a schemer. So like it could be something he was hiding from Kaido and Kaido doesn't seem, he seems like just pure strength, right? Like I'm strong, I'm gonna kill everybody that way. So yeah, at the end of the day, I feel like Orochi is still alive. I'm probably gonna do an entire video of like, is he actually alive? Would it make sense? How his story goes and his character and everything. But be on the lookout for that. But pretty much after Orochi's death, Kaido gives like his, Orochi's men an option to choose to be with him or be like on the other side. And he only gives them five seconds to choose. Now this is interesting because this betrayal could actually lend uh, the samurai side more men, like kind of uniting the forces of Wano in a way. Another video I'm probably gonna do is like the future of Wano because I do have some ideas of like where this could go next and how Big Mom and Kaido could get defeated. But as of right now, it's pure chaos. Yamato finds out she's gonna be the new ruler of Wano. She comes out pissed, screaming. Somebody else is calling for the Toby Ropo to show up. So like, it's just pure chaos right now. The next big thing I think is gonna happen is obviously saving Momonosuke because he almost got killed this chapter with Kaido slamming like his fist right above his head. And we're probably gonna see some real fights happen soon, but for this chapter, it's an absolute banger. You guys already knew. Everything was well executed, it left me wanting wanting more so couldn't be any other rating but what did you guys think what did you think of one piece chapter 985 let me know in the comments below as always thank you guys for watching i hope you enjoyed if you did enjoy please hit that like button helps a lot with the youtube algorithm and if you want to keep up to date with when i'm posting new videos or when i'm doing live streams probably doing a high q reaction stream to like the finale i know it's not one piece so anybody who's interested it'll probably be later today so be on the lookout for that but you gotta hit that subscribe button to keep up with everything as of right now we are over 2200 subscribers already remember our next big goal at 5000 discord at 5k help us get there hit the subscribe button hit the bell to join the crew as well follow me on twitter i'm dking4 video for you right there playlist for you right there and i'll see you guys next time peace